turns out there are a lot. There's a lot of iPhones. And no matter what you think about the iPhone, the first iPhone, this guy right here, the, uh, the original, it's pretty legendary. It was unveiled at Macworld 2007. It was shown off in a glass case. It had that memorable Steve Jobs moment on stage, an iPod, a phone, a breakthrough internet communicator. These aren't all three separate devices. This is one device. It was pretty clear Apple had something pretty special on their hands at that moment. And you can mark that day on the calendar as a pretty obvious inflection point towards getting to where smartphones are today. Now today, we're all the way up to iPhone 13. Lucky 13. And actually the 13 is a lineup of phones. It's a bunch of phones. And they all have world-class cameras, lots of proprietary silicon, way more software features, and it's, it's a tightly packed collection of parts that would've been basically impossible back in 2007. So clearly a lot has happened since then. So today, I've got every single iPhone that's ever been released, one through 13, and I'm gonna review them all. Now, some of them I've seen before, some of them I've never even touched or held. It's the first time I've ever gotten them in the studio, and now they're working. So I just wanted to look back and see how far these phones have come, and it's, it's actually pretty incredible when you put them all next to each other. So. Join me. Also, stay tuned for the graphs at the end. We got some good graphs. So, January 9th, 2007, the first iPhone. So, here's a fun fact. There's an article from The Guardian that shows that apparently six out of 10 Americans knew that an iPhone was coming before it was officially unveiled. So, this was an incredibly hyped thing, but it came out, and when it finally did, it was immediately pretty recognizable. You've got this two-tone design, metal up top, plastic at the bottom for all the antenna pass-through, a very recessed headphone jack that actually prevented lots of non-Apple headphones from working with it. And this thing here really set the tone for the rounded corners, the flat front, and the general UI of completely depending on a multi-touch screen for everything, including a virtual keyboard, which was pretty bold at the time. Now it had a bunch of things missing. So it had no app store on it when it launched. So basically you could use the included apps and that's it. And there were some good ones, you know, Safari's here. There was a YouTube app, Google Maps was included. There's a stock and weather app, but you couldn't get anything else. You also couldn't even set a wallpaper. Every single non jailbroken original iPhone was rocking the same wallpaper. Absolutely nothing, pitch black. All these numbers too are pretty hilarious, but let's just put them out there for context. Three and a half inch display, two megapixel camera on the back. It launched with a four or eight gigabyte storage version and the starting price was $499, which was pretty expensive for a phone. It's one of the most recognizable phones ever. It's the only one that had a SIM card tray at the top. It's the only two-tone iPhone they ever made. And fun fact, this launched in, well, it was announced in January, but then it didn't actually launch until five months later in June, basically. And then not till another eight months later did they drop a 16 gig version. But you know, looking back, even though it obviously had a lot objectively wrong with it and a bunch of things missing about it, there was clearly a lot about the original iPhone that stood out, that was better than what was out on the market. And that's why it had such an impact. But there was a sequel and that sequel was the iPhone 3G. So this was called the 3G, not the iPhone 2, because it was the first one using a 3G network instead of Edge. And there were some big changes. First of all, it does feel a lot more like a refined version of the original iPhone, actually. It's all black plastic now, just smooth, like a pebble, mainly because it's way more tapered, so it actually feels and looks thinner, but that actually does lose you some space on the inside. So the battery in this phone is actually smaller than the original iPhone. The volume rocker and the iconic mute switch that are already here kind of blend into the side now though. But software wise, this was another big step. Originally, there were no plans for an app store. Like I said, first one didn't have it. Steve Jobs said everyone should make web apps for Safari, but they changed course and reconsidered. So this phone launched with the app store, which started with 500 apps in it. And we all know how that skyrocketed from there. So this is iPhone OS 2 on the iPhone 3G. Then we got the iPhone 3GS, the first ever S update. S here, we could safely assume, is for speed, but also you could say it stands for silver because really the only difference on the outside is the text on the back of the phone goes from gray to reflective silver. Other than that, this phone's the exact same design and dimensions. You could fit the same cases as the 3G, but the internals all got upgraded. So it's a faster chip made by Samsung that is literally twice as fast toss in 256 megabytes of RAM and a three megapixel camera and a slightly larger battery, and you got yourself an S update. But looking back at it today, I could also argue the S stood for software because it got some pretty big features again. 
iPhone OS 3 finally added cut, copy, and paste, finally. And believe it or not, this was the first year the iPhone could actually record videos in the camera app, along with autofocus and auto white balance. I also noticed the vibration motor got a lot better on the 3GS. It's a little smoother and less rattly than the first two. Now, this is also the first iPhone that had a major gate attached to it. So there was a white version of the 3GS and it started having weird discoloration issues, turned out to be because of heat. So Apple ended up just recommending that people not leave their phone in a car for a long time in the sun or not use their phone for an extended period of time on a hot day. Not ideal, kind of a classic Apple response, but it turned out to be fine. So iPhone 4, I think I can safely say, was their best new design and maybe their best design ever. Uh, it was hyped into oblivion from that famous Gizmodo leak before launch, but it eventually was revealed and we still see shades of this iPhone in today's iPhones. So first of all, it only launched in one color, black. They had to make a special white version later, but it's got the new square design that at the time on stage was called the thinnest smartphone on the planet at 9.4 millimeters. And you know, there were a couple others that were a little thinner, but more importantly, it's all flat sides now on all the sides. It's more grippable, it's more iconic, it's got the circular individual volume buttons, it's all glass and stainless steel, it's pretty sweet. But then the feature list this phone also got is crazy. So, okay, this is the first iPhone with a higher resolution display. This is the Retina display, which doubled the pixel density and looked dramatically better than any previous iPhone. Then it was also the first iPhone to use an Apple branded chip. So it was still made by Samsung, but this now had a one gigahertz Apple A4 chip inside with half a gigabyte of RAM. So now it supports multitasking for the first time and apps won't close when you jump between them. And this is the first iPhone with a selfie camera. So you could have this sweet new video calling service called FaceTime. Plus they bumped the rear camera up to five megapixels, which let them shoot 720p video and it had enough fidelity for 5X digital zoom. And I also remember this phone being really hot. It was, it was talked about a lot, even though it's nowhere near the most popular iPhone by total sales, it did break all the records of all the previous iPhones and it had people waiting outside stores for it. And it sold 1.7 million in the first weekend, just, just because it looked so different and it was so much better than the previous phones that they'd made. But also this new design was the source of easily Apple's biggest gate yet. Uh, of course, to have all these new antennas on the outside in the stainless steel band was a really clever idea. Shout out to Johnny Ive. Uh, but that also meant that when you gripped the phone like this, which I guess you could when phones used to be this small, it caused a, it just dropped actually, a noticeable drop in signal strength uh, to the point where you would actually drop a phone call if you were on the phone and held it covering the antenna bands. This issue eventually grew so much that Apple issued a statement that it's not that bad and the formula calculating the number of signal bars isn't quite right and we'll fix that with a software update, but also don't hold your phone like that. <laughs> but eventually they caved and made this. You may remember the legendary free bumper case. Every iPhone 4 buyer could apply in an app to get a free bumper. What a classic. This is also the last iPhone unveiled by Steve Jobs himself. So iPhone 4S, this was again a small upgrade and again, mostly a speed slash specs upgrade. They clearly had a good thing going with the iPhone 4, so they didn't change too much on the outside other than, again, having a white version. And the antenna layout is improved, of course. But this is definitely a refinement. There's a new eight megapixel camera shooting 1080p video. And at this point, we're now on iOS 7. Tim Cook actually said in an interview, though, around the time this phone came out, that the S in iPhone 4S stood for Siri, which came out with the phone and was right around the same time that Google was coming out with their voice assistant. Early versions of Siri were pretty rough, uh, but of course it would start to get better over time from that launch. Now iPhone 5 brought the biggest feature, literally, that people were hoping for that the 4S didn't bring. That's a larger display. So this is the beginning of the inflation of the iPhone. Believe it or not, every single iPhone up to this point has had a three and a half inch display. This one is a four inch screen but it's still a retina display, still same pixel density, and still a pretty square design, but this time much more metal. And it's also much more durable because of that. And it felt more industrial, especially in the hand, a little more heavy. But this is also the first iPhone with LTE and the first one with a whole one gigabyte of RAM for even more multitasking on this new massive display. But probably the most important change here is the killing of the 30 pin connector and the introduction of this newer, much smaller port 
the lightning port. Maybe the only bad thing that came from this phone is when they replaced the preloaded Google Maps app with a new Apple Maps app, which was just absolutely terrible at launch, but the bigger screen and the beloved design combined and this phone really took off in sales. This sold out 20 times faster than the 4 and the 4S, and during the first 16 days of sales, it accounted for over 20% of all phones sold. Now, Android was definitely heating up alongside it. Maybe leave a thumbs up on this video if you wanna see an Android version of this look through history, and make sure you subscribe to see that if we get there. But you could say with the iPhone 5, Apple sort of caught lightning in a bottle here. <laughs> get it? Because, because the lightning, Anyway, the next year we got the iPhone 5S and the iPhone 5C, two very different iPhones. So the 5S continued on the path of the flagship iPhone, which had been steadily increasing in price. This one now started at 649 at launch, definitely expensive at the time, but very much still a flagship. And this actually is the first iPhone I ever owned and reviewed. This is actually the one I'm holding right now. It's still got the squared off design, but little refinements like the chamfers and the new gold color they included. But the most important new feature here, aside from even more speed, is the Touch ID fingerprint reader on the home button. Now, iPhone 5C on the other hand is much cheaper and a much more colorful option to live alongside it. In fact, that's probably what the C stood for, cheap, colorful. But it's funny when you look back at the pricing, this was still in the days where most iPhones were linked to a two-year contract. So the iPhone 5C was 99 bucks with a contract, while the 5S is 199. But the idea is basically it's a repackaged iPhone 5, but now put in a plastic body. So some people love this design. To me, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. It's kind of like iPods, but definitely wasn't my favorite. I do wanna say though, I think both of these phones really showed the pressure that Apple was feeling from the Android world, especially. You know, Apple likes to pretend no other company exists. They're just in their own little vacuum comparing themselves to the iPhones they've already made. It's the best iPhone ever. Of course it is. Uh, but I feel like this screen getting larger was obviously there's a symptom of all phone screens getting larger and larger and offering that and more features. And then of course, offering a cheaper iPhone. God, that's so neon. But you know, there was much other cheaper phones coming out and having the only iPhone be the expensive one wouldn't bode well, so they made both. But then came iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. They're not my favorite designs of the iPhone ever, and honestly, they're probably not Apple's either. But on the other hand, they are some of the best selling, most popular smartphones ever made. So they probably don't mind that. 4 million plus on the first day, 13 million in the opening weekend, Jesus and 220 million plus total iPhone 6s and 6 Pluses sold. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of phones. So the squared off sides are gone now and it's much thinner and the volume buttons are even more elongated. This is now the first ever iPhone with a camera bump. But really the biggest physical change with these phones is they are now relatively massive. iPhone 6 has a 4.7 inch display and this first ever plus sized phone here has a 5.5 inch 1080p display that Apple calls Retina HD. It's now finally gotten so tall that they have to move the power button down from the top over to the side so it would still be reachable. Now, I've personally always liked the big phones and anyone else playing in the Android world is aware that there's tons of other big phones out there. But this, from this, I mean, in one year, that is a huge step. You might remember the word phablet Pretty dumb word, but it, you know, there's phones like the Galaxy Mega and these other huge phones that are blurring the line between a phone size and a small tablet. So we're, we're in this world now where we're offering the biggest possible phone and uh, there would be consequences. Yeah, this phone started to have some durability issues. Ben Gate is probably the most famous gate of all time. There is, uh, there's Lou's video, of course, bending the phone straight in half. I believe that is the most viewed tech gadget video of all time, correct me if I'm wrong. But really, yeah, this was Apple's first time making a phone this big and you know, in hindsight, yeah, sheesh, it's very thin and uh, it needed some structural reinforcement. So that is of course where iPhone 6S and 6S Plus come in. So they fixed a lot of the hardware issues, reinforced 7000 series aluminum being one of them. And of course they were faster too, another S for speed. How about doubling the RAM to two gigabytes too? Not bad. And at this point we're on the Apple A9 chip inside, which is still getting pretty huge performance boost with each new iPhone. They're on a pretty big ramp here. 
But the big new feature inside this phone, tell me if you remember this one, 3D touch. A pressure sensitive layer underneath the display that would let you distinguish between a normal tap and a deep forceful tap and it was paired with this incredible new vibration motor they call a Taptic Engine. So it had already been awesome in the Apple Watch for a couple months and in the MacBook's trackpad, now it's in the phone. And honestly, I really liked 3D Touch and I miss it now, spoiler alert, it's gone, but it was really up to app developers to decide what they wanted to do with it. A lot of it was just previewing links inside a mini browser and small shortcuts from home screen icons, but this feature would not last very long. Fun fact though, this was another year that the iPhone had a smaller battery than the previous year. The new reinforced aluminum and 3D touch took up more internal room, so you had a battery shrink. But also, the camera bump in this iPhone, 12 megapixel camera, 2015. This was the first 12 megapixel camera, and every single iPhone they've ever made since then has also had a 12 megapixel camera. So six months later, we got a surprise mid-cycle addition to the iPhone lineup the iPhone SE. So this is definitely a lot of people's favorites. It's actually the oldest iPhone out today that still supports the newest version of iOS. iOS 15 runs on the OG iPhone SE, five-year-old phone. And this was really Apple's move to bring back the small phone. And while the SE officially stands for special edition, we can also easily call it the small edition because this brought back the smaller four-inch screen size back from the iPhone 5 series. And even alongside Apple's other phones, it's it's impressively light and small. It was also cheaper and didn't have you know, flagship features like 3D touch. It was basically an iPhone 5S with the new chip and the new 12 megapixel camera inside. But yeah, this was the beginning of the end of small phones right here. Every tiny phone Apple does from here on out, if you'll notice, is some sort of a special labeled edition. But Apple still knows, like people want smaller phones and these tiny pocketable flagship spec phones are very rare. Now, iPhone 7 and 7 Plus were very memorable and have left their mark on the rest of the smartphone world for a couple reasons. So honestly, even though the design didn't change much, I could argue this is one of the most important iPhone updates ever. First of all, the plus size iPhone had multiple cameras for the first time ever. So of course, there were some other phones that just beat Apple to the punch you know, HTC made an Evo 3D and HTC had uh, a 1M8 with a depth sensor, but this was just a straight up second camera for telephoto, optical zoom, and portrait mode, which would also arrive months after launch in a software update, by the way. But then second, this was the first iPhone without any real physical buttons. So this home button for the first time is just a solid glass surface with the Touch ID fingerprint reader and the Taptic engine behind it. So it doesn't actually click, it's the first force touch home button. And as you know, the home button has now officially started to make its way out. But on top of all of this, this is the iPhone that got rid of the headphone jack. Mark it down, September 2016, there's the infamous Courage explanation on stage, the lightning earbuds bundled on the box, and of course, you know, other smartphone manufacturers would immediately start turning and making fun of the iPhone in any commercial and any event they could get the chance, but we all know how that went from there. Because as you know, AirPods were also announced at that same event, and they would go on to become incredibly popular wireless earbuds, and everyone else wants in on that action too which shifts the whole landscape of what's expected now from smartphone audio, for better and for worse. Also, I just gotta say, I, I think this single year that they ever did this Jet Black was super sick, even though it caught all kinds of fingerprints and scratches, I loved it. But also, oh, this felt like the first year that Apple started to think about two different iPhones, one being a little more pro than the other. It wasn't called the Pro, but the iPhone 7 Plus was the one that had an extra camera, and it also had an extra gig of RAM. So having portrait mode, it just had a little bit more than the regular sized iPhone. So this is the first time they're starting to like branch that off. Now the next year in 2017, we got three iPhones. Now it's really branching off. We got iPhone 8 and 8 Plus, and iPhone 10. So iPhone 8 and 8 Plus, these are, these are pretty minor upgrades, of course. Honestly, pretty boring. Same design as the 7, same sizes just a spec bump now and with true tone and wireless charging. And I will also give them credit for being the first smartphones to record 4K 60 FPS video. So there you go. But they were immediately upstaged and outshined minutes later with the reveal of the iPhone 
10, that big X. Everyone called it the iPhone X. So the true beginning of the future of the iPhone. So this was a huge redesign that was in the works for years. And honestly, I personally loved it. A lot of things about it. The home button is gone. Everything is gestures on the screen now. The bezels are also now mostly gone with a new OLED screen for the first time in an iPhone instead of an LCD that wrapped right up to the corners and looked super modern. And the home button also being gone means touch ID is gone. So instead you have face ID, a whole facial recognition suite with an IR blaster and a dot projector in this notch up here at the top. But the thing about the iPhone 10 that rippled through the smartphone world more than anything else, the price tag, <laughs> one, thousand dollars now you know over the years we had seen phone prices slowly increasing you know 459 559 599 619 649 and actually the iphone 8 and 8 plus at the time launched at 699 and 799 but the base config 64 gig iphone 10 started at a thousand bucks just jumped right up to the top and i think the first reaction was like what you can do that you can charge a thousand dollars for a phone and people will actually buy it that was the thing like it was a good phone really nice oled screen much improved over the previous generations but people bought this phone a lot and i think that kind of opened pandora's box for everyone else going oh so we can we can make a crazy high-end spec phone too we can keep selling a cheaper one but we'll make a lot more money if we do something like this but another fun fact maybe the biggest ding on iphone 10's legacy is it is officially the fastest discontinued iPhone of all time. Usually they keep around every phone for like an extra year with a discounted price. This is one of the ones that didn't stick around and it lasted officially 10 months before being axed when the 10s came out. But that was the new variation. iPhone 10s, iPhone 10s Max, and iPhone 10R. Okay, so now that we fully moved on to this new form factor, 10s is a refinement and a spec bump in the same design, same size. The difference is this time they're also making an even bigger version with a bigger screen and an even bigger price tag called the Max. So they've gone from plus now to Max as the word they're using. And the bigger phone does have the same specs as the smaller one, but the Max has of course the biggest ever screen in an iPhone again, jumping up to 6.46 inches. Really feels like a modern big phone. They couldn't go entirely super high priced phones though, so we also got an iPhone XR, which really was just them bringing the iPhone 8 into the new notch design. Now, I was not the biggest iPhone XR fan, but at the time, you gotta understand, most people don't need the highest end phone, and most people were not going to notice the incredibly low resolution 720p LCD versus an OLED. Even though it was a $750 phone and they deserved better, this was the phone most people should get. So this is the colorful option that became the one I recommended for most people, even though the 10s and 10s Max were clearly much better, but they were just still so damn expensive. Now the next year, 2019, the naming gets a little simpler, I guess. iPhone 11, iPhone 11 Pro, and iPhone 11 Pro Max. Eh, maybe that's not simpler, it's actually more complicated. But the iPhone 11 is the cheapest, smallest iPhone with an LCD display. What's crazy now though is this baseline smallest iPhone 11 has a larger display than the previous plus sized iPhone 8 Plus. So the inflation has given everything on the market bigger screens. But also now camera bumps are becoming a design feature and the iPhone has settled into this relatively inoffensive rounded off square in the corner. And at this point, really the only knock on this design is that all of the competition has already moved on from the notch, already by this point. They're all on hole punches, much smaller cutouts, even starting to do this crazy high-tech stuff behind the screen. But the iPhone is sticking with this notch and that'll be a theme right up until the end of the iPhone here. Then at the high end, this was the first year of Apple doing a pro named phone. So now we've gone from plus to max to pro. And I, honestly, I think they're just playing with the name to see what they can get away with selling for more money. But here they have already killed off 3D touch. So the extra hardware is gone. And now it's just a long press that we know today as haptic touch instead of 3D touch. And this is the first iPhone to now have triple cameras on the back as they've added their first ever ultra wide. Shout out to LG for pioneering this one, RIP. So now we're starting to get to what we recognize as the modern iPhone. I'm also curious if you leave a comment, do you think they're gonna move on from the word pro to a different word? Again, 
plus max pro is there another word that could continue to upsell better screens better cameras better features better batteries maybe but now we can't forget the crowd favorite another mid-year refresh for the second generation iphone se again se is special edition but also this is the smallest edition since this is now by far the smallest iphone apple makes with a 4.7 inch display it feels tiny compared to the rest of the lineup and really to the rest of the smartphone world, but that's the world we live in now. This is more or less an iPhone 8 with a few tweaks and the new chip inside, and that alone is good enough to make it one of the best options out there, especially in the camera and performance department. And I'm also gonna say this is the best red they've ever made. Yeah, it's the best red they've ever made. Also, the 399 starting price really puts things into perspective. The fact that this is the cheap phone now how inflated the prices have become. This had to be their offering for competing in the budget area where so many others are kicking their butts. This deserves a chart. It'll be a good chart. But then last year, we got four new iPhones, all of them slightly different, but it's a whole lineup now. iPhone 12 mini, iPhone 12, iPhone 12 Pro, and iPhone 12 Pro Max. And the square sides are back, baby. <laughs> this design now feels like if the iPhone 10 and the iPhone 4 got together and had a baby. A couple things here. We did finally get to 5G with this one, kinda. If you saw the full review, you know what I mean. But then the Pro Max this time actually does have slightly different, impressively even better set of cameras from even the Pro and the rest of the lineup, including a larger primary sensor with the new sensor shift stabilization. And this is also the first ever year of a mini iPhone, which hilariously has roughly the same screen size as the plus-sized iPhone from just three years ago from the iPhone 8 Plus. But this also continues the odd tradition that Apple seems to be keeping going now of announcing a new camera feature on stage, but then not delivering it in the phone on day one and figuring it out with a software update later. So Pro Raw, a new camera codec for raw photos from the iPhone, uh, was announced on stage, didn't come out till two months later. But what the iPhone 12 lineup will probably be most famous for is shipping in those new smaller boxes that don't have charging bricks inside. So uh, yet another move Apple's made that was made fun of a lot. And then literally a year later, you start to see other manufacturers, Samsung, Xiaomi, already doing it. And I wouldn't be surprised if this becomes the normal in the smartphone world, but that's what we'll probably remember most from the iPhone 12 year. But then last but not least, lucky iPhone 13. And it's the same lineup as last year, from the smallest, cheapest 13 mini, all the way up to the largest, most premium 13 Pro Max. Another minor update on paper, but as you know, it was to the three most important areas of the phone. The cameras all got better across the board. And I'm saying these pros have the best camera system in any smartphone on the market right now. So that's not bad. Then the battery life got better across the board too, since the phones are now slightly thicker and heavier than last year because of the bigger batteries and the displays got better, particularly the Pros, which now finally have a high refresh rate ProMotion display that goes up to 120 hertz. And just to keep this new tradition going, ProRes Video was announced for the Pro iPhones, not in the phones yet. As of right now, it's coming with a software update. So overall now, counting all of the Minis and Maxes and Pros and Pluses and SEs, 33 models of iPhones have ever been made. I hope I'm counting that right. Um, but that's over 14 years of the iPhone existing. So there's been a lot of these things. And the fun fact now is there's over a billion iPhones active in use right now. But speaking of numbers, big graph guy here. I really like seeing these numbers visualized in some sort of a beautiful graphic way. So that's what we're gonna do here. Uh, I think this is the best way to understand like how far these phones have come or even just see some interesting patterns. So first one, which is kind of funny, uh, total storage that's been in the iPhone. This is a graph of the total storage size available in every iPhone of every year. So we all saw the first iPhone launch with four or eight gigabytes of storage, which was a pretty good number at the time. But then slowly year over year, it's bumped up in a pretty steady fashion till this year, the max storage size you can get on an iPhone is over a thousand gigabytes. That's pretty sick. And it makes me wonder where we'll all be, you know, shooting ProRes video maybe to one petabyte iPhones in a couple of years, maybe. We'll see. Performance has been also a pretty steady curve upward. Shout out to Moore's Law. And while I wish I could do like a Geekbench score for every year or something, 
there is no Geekbench score for some early iPhones, but it's interesting to see how the amount of RAM in these phones was stable for a bit at one gig, and then has been pretty steadily ramping up since. Not as crazy as some other phones out there, of course, but that's cool to see. But speaking of stable, here's a funny one. Megapixel count in the cameras. We started with a two megapixel camera on the original iPhone, then they got up to eight, which is kind of a sweet spot, pause for a bit, and then they notched up to 12 megapixels with the iPhone 6S. And that's been where every single iPhone camera has been since. I kind of want to predict like what the next number will be. In order to do 8K video, they have to jump up to 30 or 33, but we'll see where they go. There's a lot of companies whose megapixel charts look absolutely crazy next to this one. Screen size is another fun one though. We talked about the pressures of all the rest of the smartphone world making bigger and bigger phones. The iPhone was a three and a half inch screen for a while, but then the dam broke and we got bigger and bigger sizes. But they've also tried their best to keep a somewhat small iPhone in the mix. You gotta respect them for that. But this also may be the last year we actually see a really good mini iPhone. So if you are still in the market for a tiny one, get one while you can. Okay, here's a fun one. Starting prices. So here are the starting prices for the iPhones released every year starting in 2007 all the way through 2021 off contract. So of course it's more common for people to buy phones off contract now than they did a decade ago, but you can pretty clearly see that ramp. The 999 iPhone wasn't actually that monumental of a jump from the previous phones. It was just such a mental hurdle though of a number when you add a digit. So also fun fact, the most expensive iPhone you can get right now, $1599, which is a lot more than the most expensive iPhone you could get at the beginning, which was $599. Okay, last but not least, just for fun, we can visualize sales. The iPhone clearly had a really big surge from like 2011 to 2015, and the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus were a big part of that. They were the best selling iPhones of all time, and I think it's safe to say that is the best selling smartphone of all time. But now iPhone sales are of course plateauing, they're closer to saturated, and that's why Apple's working on growing other categories like services and accessories to the iPhone. So that's how we got from here to here, one to 13. What does the iPhone 14 bring? I don't know. Only the people working on it know, but uh, I hope it has a port. That's all I'll say about that one. Either way, that's been it. Thanks for watching. Catch you next year, Apple. <laughs> Peace.